Hey. hey, Andrew, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm well, and you, Daniel, how are I'm, you? I'm doing all right. We're telling, we convinced the children not to use their scooters in the house, so that seemed like <laughs> a good success of negotiation. I was very pleased with that, so we are doing well. I, I appreciate you looking over that uh, Mar Maurice Blondel stuff I sent you. That was kind of you to read. Yeah, I haven't finished it yet. I'm almost finished. I'm a very slow reader. That's a good thing. That is an asset, Mr. Luber. That is an asset, Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, you're you're a good writer. You're okay. a good writer. I, I like I like how you uh, get your thoughts out. I really do. Well, thanks. Um, but uh, with I'm shocked he's not. I've never heard of this guy. I know. I know. It's very interesting because I feel like uh, I mean I haven't read his work, but like at least how you understand it, it just seems really really important stuff. I feel like it's like hard to miss. Like. When you think about it, it's like, like you, like you always say, like, uh, once you get like a good idea, basically kind of like, it's hard to like get out of that idea a little bit. Mm. It's it, like act, action. It's so simple. And yet it's so pivotal to the thinking process at the same time. So it's, uh, definitely very interesting how, uh, thinking is irrelevant without action where most people would think it's kind of the opposite where like without thinking uh, at, action kind of holds no weight where it's really, it's the other way around. Like the action hold makes the thinking hold its weight. And I think that's a more appropriate way of looking at um, the dichotomy between the two for sure. Oh, absolutely. And Javier, good to see you. Javier, Andrew here is awesome. He's done tremendous work on theme. Heidegger, we have such good um, conversations. And the, we talked about the phenomenology of the artist. And Andrew, Javier here is outstanding. And actually, Andrew, I was speaking with you on Boober. Javier has been doing great work on Boober and different things. So Javier is nice. an outstanding individual. Uh, but to comment on what you're saying, um, also, too, I, uh, the Zoom has been doing this thing where the camera switches with motion. I think I fixed it. But if so, I think it's, you know, they didn't update and broke everything. You know how that goes. So we'll see. Uh, but anyway, um, I think, Mr. Blondell, I'm very interested. I, I've, um, I think I mentioned to, it, to you, Andrew, is mm -hmm. there seems to have been a almost modern counter-enlightenment or counter-modernism that entailed people like Blondell, uh, I think her name, uh, uh, Planier, uh, Benjamin Fonda, I can keep going. And you see, the issue is that since their thoughts did not fall into the kind of the preset conversation that was going on, it's almost like they were forgotten and they weren't really paid attention to. Like, for example, Benjamin Fonda in Existential Monday will talk a lot about the virtues of irrationality, right? And so if you're following the academic track, that sounds like he's talking about like madness or crazy. You're like, oh, come on. And you kind of blow it off. But really by irrationality, and I've mentioned to, this to you, before i think he's talking about non-rationality as in things mm -hmm. that cannot be reduced to rationality but because he was making a claim that was not readily accepted by academia and he was using language that made it sound like he supported insanity he gets blown off to the side when really i would argue that benjamin fondaine in a very funny way is aware of game theory he's aware of nash equilibrium before other people are and a nash equilibrium is a situation where if everyone is rational you get a suboptimal result he fully understood right. that um totalitarianism resulted from autonomous rationality but since since you're you know you're in a live where modernism is the, you know the uh, formal effort for certainty and really putting forth rationality that gets blown to the side and then this is also what i think is really interesting Postmodernity is not necessarily a alternative to modernity, but a reaction against modernity. So the thoughts of, say, the counter uh, counter modernism are not necessarily part of postmodernity because postmodernity is more of a critique against modernity. Right. Whereas, say, in counter modernity, it's almost like taking a different take on, the, say, the primacy of action or the primacy of logic that has to take seriously otherness or the other. Um, but that doesn't fit necessarily into a postmodern framework. So then people like Maurice uh, Blondel get, get left out of the conversation or Benjamin Fondaine or, uh, or Korobaska, which I actually think 
are some extremely useful resources for dealing with philosophy today or dealing with different issues that are people going on. So I think there, there's a treasure trove uh, that has been missed in this uh, modern counter. This uh, I'm not sure if I want to call it uh, the counter modernism or modern counter enlightenment. I'm not sure, but I think Maurice Blondel is a great example and I'm glad you like him. And Mr. Jockin, it's always good to see you, my good man. I'm Andrew here is awesome. We've had so many fantastic conversations. I'm glad that you're getting to meet Mr. Mr. Andrew. He is tr tremendous. Uh, so, so we were just talking about, um, uh, Andrew and I have been talking about a guy named Maurice Blondel. He wrote a book called Action. Actually, Jock, and I think you'd really like him because he really wants to say that philosophy lost sight of action since Aristotle. And he sees himself as working within an Aristotelian framework where a lot of that metaphysics was misunderstood. Um, mm -hmm. And he's kind of really talking about a philosophy of action in a, in a positive way. So I, f I find him an interesting thinker. I, I did want what this... Action with uh, uh, Blondell, your conversation with, uh, uh, God, I forget his name. Uh, it was like the second most recent video you posted. Uh, Nicholas? Uh, I Philippe. Think? Yeah, I love Philippe. Yeah, yeah. What a great conversation. I, I it, it reminded me of our conversation in mm. certain ways. And it was interesting, the whole dragging dichotomy between dragging and versus how you start in the cave. And I think it's funny how Blondell, I think ties into that conversation yes. in a very interesting way um, where if you take it from like the action speaks volumes regarding the thinking process behind the action versus the thinking process is the primary uh, function that results in an action. If you kind of like flip it on its head, you kind of look at Plato's cave and to me it's like how they're in the cave in the first place if we kind of change that premise but uh Philippe right that that, yes. that was his name uh Philippe makes a very interesting point where if you if you don't flip that dichotomy on its head and you just look at it for what it is and what does the dragging mean I still think um it's addressing in a way the same issue. It's the same thing, even though it's from a different starting point, mm. if that makes sense. And I think that in itself says something, which uh, like, like the question, like how come sentiment wise, how come the same issue can arise in different contexts, but sentimentally they're the same. Mm. Um, and, and I think like to really make my point clear, like, the dragging aspect in Plato's cave is basically like it's equivalent to how you start in the cave because it's like you don't actually do an action in the dragging aspect until you're being dragged. It's like you're not doing something until you respond to the dragging where if you start from the beginning of the cave, you respond to just being in there in itself. So it's mm -hmm. still a response mechanism it's still contingent off of the response. Mm. So that ties it back into like our conversations with theme and like just having a thematic response to something. It just seems like it's almost inescapable that the contingencies for any form of apprehension is based off of a response of some kind. Mm. You're responding. You're, you are, you are, regarding something or corresponding or relating in something and that's always seems to be like the starting point for mm. no matter how you cut it up so i just find that interesting like why is there a response why does there have to be a response for us to get any form of uh opinion or any form of anything it seems mm. like mm. No, that's wonderful. And then I'll pass it on. First off, Javier, thank you for the cameo of your cat. That was fantastic. <laughs> Sam, wonderful to see you as always. Third, I think Blondell, you know, in the there's kind of almost a distinction between act and action, which is kind of a difficult mm -hmm. distinction because the words are so similar. Where an act is, say, they're acting in, in Plato's cave. But funny enough, the action is when the individual lets themselves be dragged because then they are not right. just, it's not just given to them. And there's a different theme, you know, using your language that's being occupied for. So what's very interesting right. is Blondell is suggesting 
that the majority of times what ends up happening is that we're engaged in act, but we're not engaged in action, uh, you know, in a sense where you don't own your act, you just get carried by your act. And therefore, you are not aware of the fact that you're always in this, uh, you're always in a posture of a kind of response to the environment, right. to the situation that you're in. And the question is, to what degree do you become aware of that? And then that you engage in action. And then the million dollar question is, is it possible to leave Plato's cave without being dragged by another? Is it actually possible without being dragged yeah. to engage in action versus just act? Or must the first action be being dragged? Uh, the, the trauma that wakes you up from your dogmatic slumber, the experience of wonder. This is kind of that million dollar question I keep, I keep uh, going back on. Um, I think if you look at the history of the human race, we're at a point where we've gone through enough self-reflection where I do think it's possible now to not even have the whole allegory scenario. Mm. Now, I do, I do think it was necessary to have that external force, in a sense, drag the protagonist out of its story, so to speak, because... Um, Like, to be crude, it's kind of like, the you know, you break your bone, you break your wrist, and then your bone gets stronger. And then sure. if you keep breaking your wrist, like, obviously, it's not, like, realistic what I'm saying, but theoretically, it's like, if you keep breaking your wrist, eventually your bone will get so strong that it just won't break. <laughs> but, like, that, that is, like, my thinking, Not which is, like, if we... Ballad out analogy, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I think not the really. muscle's a better argument, but even then, the micro tearing model is not true in terms of why muscle development happens anyway. But I get your... But, Andrew, I get your point. I'm right. sorry. I apologize. Right. For no, 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 no. Yeah, my daughter, Andrew, I'm going to say Grace is like a daredevil on her scooter. And like last night, she's going like 50 miles down the hill. She would love this. She'd be like, Dad, I'm actually just making myself stronger when, I, when we go to the hospital and you pay a lot of money to fix the bone. So she's going to love that, Andrew. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, this is a fascinating question, everybody. I really appreciate this. You know, it's funny. I was just rereading. Whereas I'm reminded of the questions from Aquinas around that time period and uh, uh God, a veneros, but you're asking this question of the passive and active intellect. Mm. So there's mm. there's a live question: Is our act is our intellect of individual subjects uh, individuated, or is there a collective uh, intellect that everybody partakes in in a participation model, and that is in passive act in passive state, then it's activated mm. by certain moments of interaction? Because also what we're talking about here is one of the, is the two major categories in Aristotle of acting and acting upon. Right, so the flame basically burns, and it burns something makes it flammable. Um, so I'm sensing that's what we're talking about here. It's like this, these kind of interactions, especially of the intellect, which is fascinating. Because I've been just re I've been doing a whole bunch of research on cognition, and mm. um, one of my, I just want to share this quite interesting anecdote I just, re I just re researched. So did you guys know that for for Zoomers, right, that generation? 80 a study found that 80 percent of them are using TikTok as their primary mode of search. So they're not using Google, using TikTok. Yep. And then digging into it, why, what's going on? I was fascinated. This shows my age. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's that, it's this mode of passive, it's the degree of passivity. Because TikTok is so good in its algorithm of basically of knowing the subject, what their interests are, and their kind of domains of interest, that when you do a search under a topic that they have interest in, it serves up the content exactly what they need and just done in a more passive mode, video content consumption versus text, for example, and allows for more um, quant more quant uh, qualitative information to be searched as opposed to quantitative, meaning like the vibe, right? So let's give an example. Let's say you want to search for rooftop bars in, in Los Angeles. Well, instead of doing the Google search alert, rooftop bars in Los Angeles and finding a bunch of text sites and images and trying to schematize out, whoa, what is the best place? You just go to TikTok, search it, you got it, and you get a full vibe check of what you're getting, the restaurants, and it's by individual, and it allows for kind of high trust relate, network relationships, because usually based on people you follow that you and trust, for example. Um, so these are, mo this, so I just find that fascinating that, we're, that TikTok, a video consumption content model, is being now retrofitted to be a kind of act, a, a more active quality of cognitional search mode of right. cognition, basically, for a whole generation of individuals. Will it be per 
co-author for advertising? Absolutely. In fact, that's why this research is showing up in the first place. It's for research, it's for marketers to find out how to market the Zoomers more effectively. Where are they and where are they, where are they looking for stuff? That's basically the question of the day. Uh, mm. But I just want to share with this group because I'm hearing this conversation of, it's almost like in both in parallel acts, we're both more active in our search, but yet wildly not active. In fact, every, all the tools we're using is helping to be also allow us to be more passive in our activities and mental thoughts. Uh, this is a shared thought. I'm not sure if anyone's reject or find any issues with that. No, I think, I think that's a really, really good point. All of my friends, I'm 26. Um, all of my friends use TikTok to pretty much find out anything now. It's, it's quite insane. Uh, from my perspective, just from my experience, it seems like there's something about the search engine that seems easier to use just from like a pure practice uh, standpoint. But I really do enjoy your um, distinction with passive and active and with regard to this because it's like passive and active in terms of actively thinking or passively thinking. What Google does, you still have to do some active thinking. You still have to kind of find it where TikTok's like algorithm and search engine kind of allows you to not do that. So it's like, uh, like da Daniel and I have talked about just kind of like laziness before and like, just like technology, like very Hygarian, just ma technology making people in a sense lazy in terms of thinking. And uh, I think basically that's just what's happening. It's, it's, it's a lack of, active thinking with uh ser searching for in information it's it's just easier to search for information in terms of not thinking with tiktok and like you just it, it just like pops up and it's more like when you when you look something up it's like with google you kind of have to scroll through like with tiktok it just seems like it just pops up immediately and then like even the scrolling through process seems just like easier just you click on a video and you can kind of just like scroll to the next without like clicking out of it or uh, re researching, so to speak. Like, yeah. and by the way, like this is not just like web search stuff. Like my research and reading literacy is a huge issue. The biggest problem in reading, quite frankly, is, is that our, mo our kind of metacognitional act actions with reading is ineffective. Mm -hmm. So for example, we just read books and then ask someone to recall, tell me a summary of the book or tell me what you, what you pick up from the book. Most people fail at that, and that horrendously. And especially mm -hmm. in topics like self-help, for example, it's completely defeating the purpose of it. Like if you're not actually engaging with the text actively versus a passive consumption of the text, it's not doing you any good in terms of any growth or understanding. And so this, is, uh, this discussion, or at least this kind of topic, is not just like TikTok search versus Google search. Just to be, by the way, mm -hmm. just one share, does I know? But it's one area that's all was super... Uh, enriching just to talk about it. This happens in book reading too, or anything where the modes of our thinking is generally a lot of times too passive, as opposed, and actually blows up blows up any chance of real understanding. Right. It's, I guess perspectile knowing. It's just no, you're not putting your perspective in it. Like like uh, when when I read philosophy, it's like there's a certain level of hunger that I have, and I like kind of put my whole being in it like I'm, I'm i'm literally asking questions and slowly reading and double checking like what the person means and like that takes like an active effort of kind of putting your whole presence in it and and that um i i agree it's like the self-help book it's like I don't need to put myself in it because the book is supposed to tell me who I am to a degree is how most people think about it. And like, that's just so wrong. And, and yeah, I just completely agree with your point for sure. No, and I'll just add quickly and then give it to Javier. Bethany, good to see you. As always. And it's interesting to think because if we're there's something about Plato's cave that is both a mixture between passive and active. He is active to let himself be dragged if he's, say, resisting it, but it's also passive because he's letting himself be dragged. There could be something good about, say, image search because you can find things you otherwise wouldn't find, but then it can be bad, right, because it's, you're becoming overly passive. So it's interesting to think there's some blend here. So Mr. Javier Rivera, always good to see you, sir. Yeah, <laughs> nice to see you guys. Um, 
there's a couple of thoughts. I mean, there's a lot of thoughts. <laughs> there's a lot of thoughts. Um, I'm going to bring up Boober because I think Boober can um, give us some insight on the if you hear some background noise, that's definitely my cat just playing with his little loud balls. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, okay, I and it, the I and it relation. Um, Buber actually says that the I and it relation can be divided into provinces, which we clearly do this in our lives, where we have our, you know, my more objective life, my institutional life, my my life of just you know realm of institutions and structure basically it's very objective it's how i interact with the world and so on right but then there's like my personal my personal like domain um and boober would say like what we've done with the i and it is that we've divided it closed it off from the i and the it to where now when we come back home self self help self love whatever that you know whatever that's supposed to mean these days is what Buber would call just a realm of feelings. Like anything self-help related for the most part is just to help you achieve some type of feeling good. <laughs> you know, even even if even if the book itself challenges your own thinking, you're like, okay, in the end, it's gonna make me feel good. I'm gonna feel better. I'm gonna be better. Like the, the, all these sort of notions are um, I think what Buber would call in the realm of feeling. Um, there is an interesting point that Andrew said earlier about responding, which I came to this conclusion as well, how the most inescapable thing is that we have to respond. Like even non-responding is responding. There is there is no escape from responding. And I think this is why I like Buber so much is because everything we do is a responding. Now, the thing that you guys are getting at that's really important is how are we responding? Are we acting or are we doing action? Um, and, and this is what I really liked here because then it really shows that actually, if you are confining yourself to like the crowd, right? And I think Nietzsche and um, yeah, Buber would agree with this and, and Kierkegaard, right? If you're a part of the crowd, you are following a set of beliefs to sort of be a part of that crowd and so on. Um, so you're, you're acting in that sense. You're, you're acting. Um, but what would it mean to do like an action? I think Buber actually kind of goes into this a bit. It would be like a real genuine action would be trying to do a real decision, which turns that response into responsibility. Like you don't use the crowd as a way to deter some responsibility. Um, and I think we see this a lot where, you know, I'm a part of this party and so on, but we have this way of deterring our responsibility because we're part of the crowd. Um, and, and all, all Boober is asking that we do really is just make a genuine conscious decision. And if it so happens to align with the group or the law or whatever that may be, at least it's your genuine responding. It's your, what he calls it, your uncertain certainty <laughs> of what you decided to do. Um, but, you know, and I think that's where like the responsibility comes out because you could be wrong and you could be right, but we don't really know that till we've done it. Um, I think the problem is, is that we want to be right before we do the action. <laughs> But I'll leave it there. Um, I, th I think uh, to tie it back to like uh, what we were saying with Blondell, the relationship between thought and action um, is a good dichotomy to look at authenticity. Because I think like what you're asking, when you say genuine action, to me, it's just authenticity of all sorts, authentic internally and externally to the world. And I think like I'm a big Hygarian. And uh, I definitely think like Heidegger's like a, even though he personally might be questionable, but like his his uh, his philosophy, I think is a good place to start um, looking at like authenticity. Uh, so like, I think 
when I read Heidegger, my understanding of Heidegger ultimately was the second you're thinking about your actions, like in the moment, in the moment you're supposed to be acting, but you're thinking about the way in which you want to act in that moment, you're secondly taking yourself out of that moment. And then, and, and in sense, and, and that in sense, virtually speaking, that, let me, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, but basically when you're thinking about the moment, you're not in the moment. And that's when you find yourself being in an authentic state, you're giving yourself to the they in a sense, because you're thinking about, you're, you're, you're thinking instead of doing. So like to, to me, Heidegger likes to talk about kind of like stepping out of the way of, of being and stepping out of the way of thinking in a way and allowing action to just like take like the ring, the ring, so to speak. And how I take that is basically, with, and, I, and I told this to Daniel in a meeting, basically, it's like, think so much that when the moment counts, you don't have to think at all. It's like you have, you're like a computer and you've done enough thought processing that when the actual action needs to occur, you just act and you don't need to think about it. You don't think about the ramifications. You don't think about anything in a sense. You're, you're just doing. And it's not like, uh, uh, anti thought or anti thinking. It's just putting thinking in its appropriate place. And I think with Western thinking, we really put thinking at like an inappropriate place where we say like the classic saying, think before you act. Well, if you were to take that literally and you were to think before you act, you would be a very inauthentic being. Not saying good or bad, this to me doesn't have to do with like ethics. I mean, it does have to do with ethics, but this particularly, what I'm talking about isn't an, an ethical problem. It's like an authenticity problem. So if you're, if you're just thinking every single time before you act, there's some mediation process that's happening. And it seems very inauthentic if you have to kind of like mediate yourself to act in an, a certain way. It's so where I feel like you can, what you can do is you act, you fail, let's say, people hate you or something happens, there's a consequence. And then based off that consequence, you reflect after and you reflect enough where when an action of the same sentiment is called for, you may do it in a different way without thinking about it because you reflected enough. So I think thought is more of like an after, it's like act first almost, then think. But that could lead to very, uh, devastating things obviously but um yeah that you were just making me think of that no thank you andrew and i'll give it to sam bethany and then thomas and it's almost like philippe was mentioning you practice the guitar really hard you're conscious of it when you start right. to practice to get to the place where you don't think of it and it's interesting to right it's the thank jazz you. player yeah, yeah that yeah, different yeah. things and mr ebert always good to see you sir and sam bethany jockin so uh sam any any always good to see you sam hi um, yeah, I guess I'll just kind of build on that. Like, I think um, in relation to um, like authentic action, you need to be free or like there's no like meaning to um, to the authenticity. You know, you can't act authentic, uh, authentically when you're being controlled in some way. And I think that is sort of like that relates itself a lot to TikTok in that you know, there are a lot of constraints, um, you know, like what does, what does it mean to be acting freely or authentically on TikTok, but then to be like in this matrices of constraint. Um, but then also I think like another dimension to it would be just like, okay, so we want to be, we want to find some way of being with the with the masses, with society in a, in a larger way than just our own friends in a way that's authentic, in a way that's free, but it's sort of mediated by this, yeah, this grid or matrix of like algorithms and constraints. But I think like in the case of like the LA um, restaurant example, it's like, I think there is a dimension to it where you need to ask what, what is this, the salience of this action or act, I'm not using those words, um, like in a pointed way, just in a general way, you know, when you're looking for a restaurant, like, is this like 
a meaningful expression of free will? Like, is this where your free will is like really going to shine or is it okay to just, just look at a restaurant on TikTok? Like maybe that's not the, the defining uh, situation of freedom, but um, also what really interests me with this whole discussion at large is um, um, I'm, I guess I'm hesitant sometimes to just be um, an old lady and be like, oh, these kids, they're ruining their brains with TikTok, you know, <laughs> um, because I, what really interests me about TikTok is it's like, you know, um, writing alphabets are very good at writing language and gramophones are very good at writing sound. And it seems, as you pointed out, Thomas, like TikTok seems to be really good at writing atmospheres. And that's something that, um, you know, uh, we struggle with, you know, I, I, my day job is uh, trying to portray the atmospheres of space and it can be really hard. So um, yeah, TikTok and maybe just video more, more broadly, but I think there is something different about video in TikTok. Um, always seems to do a really good job of that. Hi, <laughs> uh, sorry that I came late, but um... I and I might be regressing the conversation a little bit just to go back to this like TikTok uh, as search engine thing is um, I I was just so so interested um, when I heard about this when I heard about kids choosing deciding to go toward TikTok as their source of information as their like epistemology model or structure um, because to me I am always. I'm trained as an art historian and so I'm always thinking about visual literacy and this sort of um, the churn of human history as like, I mean, this is like so macro again, this is why I feel like I'm regressing the conversation because I'm going like wide lens, but um, like you, you think about the like human history people before mass literacy, people heard about Bible stories from the design of um, from friezes in, uh, in, on cathedral facades. And um, you hear about, uh, like the only people who held literacy were the clergy who were able to, and then they would commission artists to portray, depict um, the atmosphere of hell to control people into to not sinning or whatever, tell them that the evils and the perils of sinning and things like that. And then you have the printing press where then people become acquainted with uh, literacy reading. And then you have um, several centuries of people of uh, learning how to, being being literate and and learning from gaining knowledge from reading and writing and now we have this like turn back and it's like a, another churn of this larger cycle where people are going back to uh visual aesthetics um that is that is not related necessarily to have having to read learn know how to read and write and so i think that that is um uh, and, and people talk about like distinctions between like Instagram and TikTok and how Instagram is like trying to be TikTok kind of thing. And people, um, like what TikTok has melded so well together are, um, is this like atmospheric, the vibe, like you can, you, the, the memes that you make on TikTok are so much different than anything else than any other meme sphere, meme plex, because you have sound, people can incorporate other people's sounds onto their stuff. It just gets incredibly layered. And to me, it's just this like holistic aesthetic experience that is uh, without reading, without the, the written word. You know, obviously people uh, caption their videos for people without, um, so that you can like still get the, the gist without, um, having the volume up or like for hard of hearing, it's also, um, having closed captioning is, is, uh, accommodating that. And so obviously it's not completely exclusionary to the written word, but it's a completely different, uh, epistemology that seems to be going back to this time of, um, not of, of before pre mass literacy. Um, and so I don't know, to me, it's just this like massive, um, it's a massive shift toward, toward needing to nurture visual literacy again. And it's also a massive shift toward inc incorporating, uh, aesthetic based knowledge. Um, but then at the same time, what's really scary is, um, is this like AI element, the, the algorithm element, um, where, how do you know, how do you, 
not only do you have to parse through the media and parse through what is false and what is true, but then you also have to parse through like, okay, when I search something because it's me and the algorithm knows me, is it really like giving me like how much have my preferences informed the algorithm? How much is the algorithm uh, informing my preferences, things like that. So it's just, um, uh, we are truly like on the brink. <laughs> um, yeah. No, that's wonderful, Bethany. And uh, Emilio, good to see you, my friend. Then we'll give it to Jockin and Alexander. And I really like that phrase, visual literacy. That was beautiful. And now I'm thinking of Mean Plexus Cathedral. So that was very nice, uh, Bethany. But Mr. Jockin. Yeah. No, these are, I mean, I'm glad my little comment about the, certain, the news about the Twitter, about um, TikTok being a search engine, um, it, it generated so much conversation. Um, I just want to build on what everyone is saying. You know, by the way, like, you know, it's interesting because um, you know, Bethany did a great job giving a chronology of our modes of literacy, right, that occurred over time, and maybe going back to a visual mode of it. I think important, and this is kind of building on a very important aspect, so I'm tutoring a, a student in English language right now. You know, the basic concept is about teaching, doing able to do all this, is the offloading of cognition. So the whole point of the aberration of writing was to get cognition out of our heads into a visual physical manifestation. I think a lot of people misunder misunderstand reading and writing as this kind of like invisible space that just like trans transparently communicates intent and knowledge and cognition, but that's not true. It actually, it's actually a very complicated process. I know this because if you try to teach someone English, the phonology of English is so complex and so um, opaque. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence or mark to sound correspondence like music composition, for example that it actually requires quite a degree of knowledge building to be able to parse writing into sound, into the, the reproduction of the sound in the mind. Um, so what I'm getting at here is this idea of fluency. So fluency is, that, is this mode that gives that impression of transparency and kind of unthinkingness and rapid rapidity of use, but it's actually because it's just been embedded, it's embeddedness, it's repetition that's been embedded so much that when we call upon it, it's it's, it's, it seems instantaneous. Because a lot, because a lot of theory and literacy has been, oh, we reread whole words, we read like massive chunks at one time. Most of the research has been moving closer to the argument that no, you're just doing your your page individual word just incredibly fast and using prediction to sometimes skip ahead and then make course corrections when you're wrong in your predictions. All this is happening so rapidly that it's transparent to you. You don't understand. You don't even realize you're doing it. Um, so I bring this up on two grounds. One is the Things that seem simple and clear is property of fluency, and that's been an illusion because it actually is quite complicated because all it takes you to do something that's slightly outside your domain knowledge, say reading another language, using the same script system, for example, let alone using a different script system to read, like going from Latin to Arabic, and you'll instantly realize how much uh, non-fluency, I see his head shaking of, the, of some people on this one, um, very rapidly from that. That's the first part. And then the second part is... Because of this, it's, I'm a little conflicted, right? Because I think some there's a question to judge the use of TikTok as a search engine for reasons of epistemological truth, for example. Um, are they getting fake news? Or are they just getting not, basically echo chambers of falsity just repeated off themselves, which is no different than any medium, but whatever. It's, true, it's, a, very, it's a valid concern. Um, there's this thing, right? This, I think kind of like kind of hinting the base, the thrust of what we're getting at here as a group is, at least by my understanding, is even though like reading and writing, all these things are modes of kind of offboarding cognition, the purpose was so that, that that hard stuff, that kind of basic stuff can get out of the way so we can do higher level processing. It's no different than doing calculations, right? We used to do calculations in our head and then we built up calculus and other mathematics to offboard it so that we can get that out of the way. And then we got computers to do it better. Just because, but just because there's calculators doesn't mean there's no mathematicians anymore. They just do other things. They don't do the basic math calculations anymore. Um, what are we doing with this stuff? I think that's kind of the next, that's basically what I'm getting at. Because if we offboard, for example, like our music preferences come from Spotify recommendations and our TikTok tells us what content to read and et cetera, et cetera. We can get visual literacy, basically like going to Pinterest to get inspiration boards for whatever topic and any genre we want. That's all great. But then I don't, I kind of like don't want to just get stuck in just the moralizing that's just lazy thought. I think that more fair, because under that argument, then Plato was right when he was writing that writing was dead speech and shouldn't be used. But I don't think anyone here would actually agree with that argument in any way. 
Uh, also, it's very ironic that Plato's character Socrates says that, but then he proceeds to write a bunch of texts. <laughs> so thus, it's kind of like ironic, probably, in my opinion. Uh, I'm taking away too much time, so I'm going to stop by just saying my, I think, I think a more interesting question than just the kind of like these dumb Zoomers are being dumb because they're just using TikTok is what are we going to do with this kind of what level, what's the next step of cognition that these kind of offboardings of the algorithm or whatever are going to allow? Is it even possible? That's my question. Because also I've been just reading essays on questions like what tools can we do to improve cognition? And I'm getting constantly frustrated because they're almost all of them are just assuming Oh, it's recall. Cognition is recall. It's your ability to just recall information, which is incredibly frustrating because that's like, yes, that's it. Like, I don't disagree that's necessary, but it's certainly not the totality. And I think when we say what really what cognition is, I mean, I, I would hope, I think our highest aspiration is creativity, which is what is that? And actually, I was going to say one last, I'm sorry, I apologize for overtaking time. Uh, one last thing is just the question of surprise. Because there's a very big difference between information and knowledge that's preset that you know you want and you're getting told what you already think right? Kind of echo chamber of properties versus like activities of cognition that give you a surprise that radically calls something into you, right? I think also this idea of like active intellect, like the real one, it's kind of a epiphany effect that should happen. When you think of epiphanies or eureka moments, these are like striking moments of lightning that hit your mind. I would feel like that's probably maybe when we say the, the, the active intellect versus the passive, maybe that's a way to distinct to draw that out. Way over time, I just I think this topic is interesting, and I hope people take what I just shared and build on it because I think it's a great topic. No, uh, I tremendous. I'm going to pass it to Alexander Ebert and then Emilio, and it makes me think when you talk about fluency. Uh, Andrew was saying at the beginning the notion that action is when you don't think about. It. So there's something about uh, for Heidegger's being of being to come through. There's almost an ontological fluency that seems important, uh, and also action, as Blondell is talking about, seems to have something to do with fluency, and maybe that connects with things we've talked about, escaping the circus and Kafka, not ending up in a little parable of Kafka, maybe there's something about fluency that connects with those different things, but uh, but Mr. Ebert, it's always good to see you, my friend, how are you doing today, sir? Good to see you guys, uh, I had to jump on because of the TikTok thing, I just had to... Um... Conduct, like, I've been having conversations about this a little bit. I, I have thoughts that are sort of tangential to this, but um, I've been thinking a lot about the aesthetics and the sort of compacted um, delivery of TikTok and, um, and thinking about the sort of synthomic reaction of people to TikTok videos. There is a certain from, to my mind, a uh, very clear lack of idiosyncratic aesthetic on TikTok. It is sort of a universalizable program. Uh, there's, it's mostly formatted and you can incorporate your own sort of ideas and then TikTok will take those ideas and turn them into a personalized version of some, you know, whatever. It could be a song and you can say your own lyrics into it and then it spits you out, spits you out your version of the song. And it's very funny and entertaining and all this, but it's also uh, devoid of uh, thumbprints, of sort of human idiosyncrasy uh, at the fundamental level. And I started to think about this idea of shallowness versus depth. And I started to you know, in having a child and, uh, and realizing at around the age of two that she was very naturally attracted to the shittiest songs imaginable, um, just absolute garbage, she would love it. And she would clap her hands and it was like pop tunes that were coming on, uh, on cartoon shows and whatnot, very well produced uh, pop songs that had no, no humanity in them, but were designed expressly to uh, shortcut the synaptic pathways to pure enjoyment. And I could tell that they were working. And I had to begin to tarry with this idea that, um, that there is an actual formula here that, uh, that must be... Um, uh, confronted in a in a philosophically like you know uh, admitted sense where it's like okay perhaps depth is actually a scaffolding that we build on top of shallowness 
that if we go to the bottom of the ocean and we're at the bottom of the ocean, we're actually in shallow waters because we're right at the base of the ground. And the depth is actually created as a superficial layer on top of shallowness. And that these things like uh, TikTok and, and, and the like have cut the depth and that scaffolding out of the picture and figured out ways to shortcut and bypass, bypass all that to get straight to the shallow base language. So we talk about like a base semiotics, a based culture where we have this complete compactment of the ocean into the shallow uh, sort of recesses where these, these a perfect example is, and, and the, this used to really upset me, <laughs> and pardon me if this, uh, if this gets personal, but uh, when I used to visit my parents or friends and they'd have the TV on and they usually have like some classic movie on like Indiana Jones and I'm watching it and I'm saying, why, what's wrong with your TV? And they say, what are you talking about? I say, it looks like a video game. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? And Indiana Jones looks like he's moving like as a video game and everything looks three dimensional, like clay modeled. I'm like what is going on? And they don't notice it. And then I realized that their TV is on the high def sports uh, setting. And it's rendering the movie and turning it into a really cheap looking uh, hi-fi video as opposed to film. And all of that saturated quality of film and cinema is removed and it's replaced with this raw schematics of the movie, the body here, the scenery there. And for, for most people that suffices. And what I'm starting to realize is that we're willing to sort of forego the idiosyncrasies of the thumbprint and the human quality of production in favor of a, an architecture that is sort of a base, um, what do I call it? Like a, a, a blueprint sort of culture where all we really need is the blueprint. For instance, right now we have a kick. We have like five kicks that you ever hear, five snakes. Sorry, I got interrupted. Five snares that are all being used, right? Uh, everyone gets these sample packs and all the songs in the world that you hear now are made almost out of the exact same instruments being played at the exact same velocity. And so, yeah, they're different songs, but they're all made with the exact same sounds. And uh, that's what I see with TikTok. I see this trend happening everywhere. And what I'm just sort of realizing is that this idea of depth may actually be a scaffolding that we built on top of shallowness and that what, we're, what we are at, at our root are actually very shallow beings that simply want that enjoyment. And someone previously talked about like, you know, self-help and these things about feeling good. Well, it seems that culture is moving more and more towards this um, sort of based idea. And I say based B-A-S-E-D as in fuck it, it's sort of like, fuck it, I don't need all of the fanciful, ornamental uh, bullshit. I just need that raw, synthomic uh, hit, you know, to my system. And TikTok gives that to me. And it's, uh, it's something that I think we're going to have to confront and it works its way into language and semiotics and uh, the compression of information and the loss of nuance and all of that. But anyway, cheers, good to be here. <laughs> Magnificent Ebert, always good to see. And everyone should know that Mr. Ebert wrote a tremendous paper on Hegel involving mathematics and the sublation of Hegel. So I'm very grateful for me, Mr. Ebert's work there. And it reminds me of what you were saying. It's kind of interesting. In a book called The Invention of News, uh, it was talking about how when news first was printed, everyone actually didn't trust it because it was funny. They said, well, how can you trust news that's not given to you by someone face to face? Where today we're almost the exact opposite, where we say if it's face to face, it's subjective and it doesn't count. Whereas there was actually an idea that truthfulness is bound up with uh, there, if I'm you know, using it correctly, the idiosyncrasy of the particular individual, that uniqueness that was bound, that if you lost that, you actually couldn't trust the news anymore. You should revisit that book because it was actually fascinating because I think it's also relevant talking about these movements to different mediums. Like who would have thought that when news was first put on paper, people were like, well, we can't trust it if it's on paper because how can we trust, uh, the only news we can trust is when it's face to face with someone. And that also speaks to the sort of um, how history can trick you to think that you're in a new age when actually there was a precedent in the past. But I will give it to Emilio and then Mr. Uh, Javier Rivera. Hello, hey. really glad to be here. Um, well, as always, like uh, the conversation is, is really, really great. Um, the, uh, well, I, I took 
like as as because there are like so many thoughts flying around. I, I took some some notes to 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 address the the, the ideas that came up when 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 you guys brought this this um really interesting ideas. One is the the thing of the the TikTok and the algorithm is that for me it's it's interesting because um obviously like we have this this notion this feeling that it's like it's hurting us in a certain way right that we say like oh that's not that like getting your information straight from tiktok is not like a great thing or like um or that but by making your your life in control or tastes dictated by an algorithm it's like it's not great right but i would argue that the problem is not the algorithm per se like the, the fact that it exists it's is the results it gives because in a very crude way you could say that the people you surround with the school you go to the job you go to the church you go to those are in a way proto algorithms that predispose you to think a certain way so now we have a, like a supercharged version of this but for example imagine if tiktok suddenly made people like happier healthier like people went to tiktok and they were like oh man like I, I now I, I get that my physical health is important. Like we would praise the algorithm, we would praise it. We would be like, this is like such a cool, nice invention. But right now we we fear it, or we or we don't like it because the results it brings is it's a negative thing. So so just like to make a little bit of a contrary point, I don't think like having an algorithm per se is is bad. It's just that results like we don't we don't we don't agree with right. And and it of course it makes sense if like the um the results sucks then we we should um make a new algorithm or make something different but i i think that's a really interesting thing because oh like uh, i was in class the other day and a professor said like oh we are so reliant on these things now and he pulled out like cell phones and i'm like of course we are like well, like there's this romanticization that like it's it's bad to be dependent on technology like my eyes are bionic like i i wear glasses like of course like um technology becomes a, an extension of ourselves and in, in a very real way because i don't know if this happens the same in humans but there was like I, this fascinating study that they, they have like a, i don't remember if it was like a, a monkey or chimpanzee that they gave him a, a a tool right so and when when they touched the point that the point of the tool the 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 brain fired up in the way as if they were touching his finger so in a way you actually understand the tool as part of yourself in that moment and very empirically you can feel say that when there's like when you drive a car and you kind of feel that the car becomes like an extension of yourself you kind of like know the spatial awareness of the car so and also like tools become like an extension of ourselves in a very real way so from something very basic like glasses to something very complex as a, as a cell phone and like of course if the cell phone didn't exist like your cognition or your thought process and everything would be different but if it exists like um of course like we are going to have like re less recall or less memory because most of the simple facts of life we are like five seconds away from a wool search from taking them and the, and people say like oh that's a bad thing and i would say that like, may maybe maybe that i i don't see the the problem that people demonize um the cell phone and when and cell phone is, is a weird thing because in the cell phone like you can do a, a lot of things maybe people say that they are referring that oh you had facebook or, or twitter or tiktok right um so i don't know i, I find that interesting and, and coming back to the tiktok is that tiktok makes composability easier than like anything that existed before because as, as bethany said like you can pick like a dance from here and now you from there and you can like reuse it like the composability aspect of it is is like there there's not been like anything close to it before right because like of course you can make a video but it's your own shots and like your own time like if you if you if it's only like lego pieces in the sense that you take them and you stack them up and this uh, thing of idea composability that i think like um patrick on not boring talked about it and it was just a, it's, it's a, like the composability allows like really strange things and if we say that the results of this composability in tiktok has been used for like um shallow ends and the, okay maybe maybe okay the results uh, are not good but the compos composability itself is is wild imagine if just a tiktok about philosophy right and you can take like an, an paragraphs of like nietzsche and like this one and you can compare them and you make like a small tiktok of this like you composability in itself it's i think it's it's like a, a very powerful thing that uh, that's cool and also i i need 
and I think it it has a lot of power over the way we 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 exist in the world because like I I don't use TikTok but like most most of my friends do and. Um, and you don't need to to use TikTok to know about the trends because you're at the party and they always are like, oh, we're going to make this new dance. And you know there's a new dance, a new trend, right? Or the, like you get exposed to it even though you like you, you don't like you can you can participate in it without having to consume through through all this. And, if, and in some ways it's even better because you get like the most salient stuff, right? So and you like get stay in the loop and stuff. Um and just like um, uh, so, uh, so something that happened about algorithms in Spotify, I was I was hearing a song, and I I think it recommended me a song, and it's one of my favorite songs right now. I love it so much, and it's and it's an algorithm, right? And you could say like, oh, is it my taste? Is it Spotify's taste? And for me, like, I I don't I don't really care. I don't really mind. Like if if the song is good, if it I don't know, and it, it's a it's a good song. It's not like a pop song. It's actually for like an indie artist that like has like six thousand monthly um listeners so it's just not i, I think i'll go there, that that would for me would be like an example of an algorithm making like um a good use of the results because it's not the pop culture saturated thing as as um that like that we every see everyone um we can all like hear the most popular song it's just like um, something really indie that some someone like will really like so i think that's an example of an algorithm maybe working more as sorry as intended um and and yeah um, um for me just just to, to close it up is that um in, in regards of the thing that we are we are like shallow right and then we we and we have like this and then we develop this deepness, but at the base, um, we're shallow. Um, I also pro probably because uh, and it's because I think almost like, for example, like all of us up here today, we have like weird, weird tastes, right? Like, because like most people don't read like philosophy stuff or don't care about like space, like, like, like it's a weird stuff, right? But if this reunion was like talking about like video games or like sports, it would be like, like maybe we would still have a great time, but we wouldn't really be thinking about these ideas. So I think that almost it comes to like a preference. It's not that people are, are like deeper and, and than others. I think it's just like, it's like the same way, the way some people like, like video games, some people like reading obtuse books about like some German guys and, and, and those are like really cool um um tastes so like but I think it's like almost the shallowness and um and the deepness like of of course if you learn certain stuff it will be like a, a richer impact in your life than watching TikTok that's of course but at the same time it's not maybe it could be I, I, I in, in some sense I agree with the metaphor, but at the same time I I, I could see it like deepness being like a taste. So yeah, there are some people that hear the like the popular song and they just hate it just like from a gut reaction, right? So it could be like more sort of a taste thing instead of being like shallow versus deep. But yeah, those those are my thoughts. And, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Emilio. I'm gonna pass to Javier and then Mr. Jock. And it makes me think um quickly on kind of idea that, yeah, like algorithms can bring forth really good things, but then at the same time, it could be changing in you in ways that you don't realize and you don't even have access to what it defines as efficient to know if it's making you efficient in a way you want, or if it's just making you Heideggerian standing reserve. It's also interesting to think how screens can say, uh, Andrew was saying at the beginning, that, you know, when Heidegger death has a way of sort of framing being in a manner that uh, it takes it, where subjects moves to Dasein and being becomes question. Well, on the screen, you have a lot of images of death, but it's funny because it's not necessarily the emotional encounter with death to have that Heideggerian effect. So it's interesting to think that these um, these ways make us think that we're approaching these um, subjects without actually um, approaching it. But uh, but but yeah, Mr. Ebert said in the comments something about an anti-optimization uh, algorithm, which I really find uh, funny because it's kind of like um, who defines what is optimization and actually creativity can come from error and mistake and sort of an anti-optimization algorithm could be a good thing. So I'll pass it to Mr. Rivera and then Mr. Jockin. You know, if I were to say Zoom had an algorithm, it would just be on the premise of just witnessing, <laughs> which I think is the only algorithm that we really need. But um, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit uh, contrary to Emilio, um, just to sort of, because I think Bethany did a really good job of sort of bringing us into like the grand scope of like aesthetics and um, how that evolved. 
But I think it does get a little bit different when we talk about aesthetics plus algorithm. And I think that's what Bar I think that's what um Ebert was getting at there. With there's like this non-human element that's thrown in in the midst of human relations. That's the part. And even though I appreciate Amelia's point with like encouraging your taste and, and so on, I, I definitely benefit from that. The problem that remains with this algorithm, right? Of just like enhancing your taste, showing you what you could like based on already what you have chosen to like. Um in my opinion, this can kind of get somebody in a loop of their own self-relating. And so what happens is everything that they touch and like, the algorithm extends their sphere of own self-relating. And so they keep saying, oh, so everything is only your ever taste, right? But the problem is, how do you relate to somebody that has a contrary taste, right? How are you going to respond to somebody that likes country music because you know your Spotify doesn't give you country music. It's going to give you a new song of the same kind of uh, genre that you like. Um, you're going to be like, this is my favorite, but it's not going to help you experience another. Um, and, and that's that over there-ness that is the, the benefit of having a self-relating negativity because it actually proves that you can't be, you, you shouldn't be stuck in a self-relating negativity. The whole point of this void is that way you can transverse over. You can actually have the possibility of experiencing another human being, of experiencing another taste contrary to yours. Um, and that's the problem that I have with algorithms, is that algorithms gets me stuck, to my, you know, gets me stuck in my cats and anime. <laughs> I never see anything new because I'm not gonna like anything new, right? It doesn't show me anything other <laughs> unless, Unless the, the funny thing is about algorithms, though, because it seems like it works, is that outside of the algorithm, you know, meaning when you walk outside and you encounter something new, otherness, then you type it in and the algorithm feeds it to you. But the moment you do that, now you're extending your sphere and it still becomes your 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 fear again. So it there's always I, I think this is what I like about Boober. Boober always shows how the it, the I and it relation and the I and thou relation are constantly collapsing into each other. If we try to say, oh, there's only one algorithm, we need to understand the moment we incorporate that algorithm is going to collapse. It's going to collapse. We need like constant collapsing in order to have a genuine human relation at all if we're to sort of use technology as a benefit of, you know, making a community, you know, because I think that's, it's inevitable, right? We're not going to stop TikTok. We're not going to stop any of that stuff. It's, it's too late for that. It's just how do we make it now more communal than this sort of self-relating void of extension of ourselves um, that can be, I mean, it's nice that, you know, again, I'm not against the whole having your personal taste. The problem re realizes when you confront somebody that has another taste, how do you deal with that? The algorithm is not gonna teach you how to deal with that. It's only gonna feed you your taste. Um, yeah, so that's that's my main <laughs> problem. <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, Javier, getting stuck with cats and anime seems like the algorithm did you a service. I don't know about everyone else. Um, now I'm thinking about, uh, you know, with, in honor of Sam, a greener side on Kafka and the algorithm. I'm thinking about Kafka and the castle, where someone's trying to get to the database or the place where you can determine what the algorithm is making us all efficient, relevant to. And there's no way to get to that castle and nobody knows where it is. And so that's kind of like the, the, the interesting idea is that, you know, we make our tools and our tools make us, you know, we make our algorithms and then the algorithms make us forget that it's making us, you know, there's almost this added level to it, but I'll hand it to Mr. Jockin and, and then Bethany. Yeah, I think Javier did a great job summarizing one of the tensions here. I mean, just, I wrote down my notes. It's the problem of surprise, right? In terms of eruptions of surprise coming in. And I brought it up earlier, but it's just, Javier did, Javi did a great job summarizing it. One other note just related to it. I mean, I, I kind of put it at mentally thinking through like what the purpose of these algorithms are. They tend to create basically, in one sense, a quasi-private meaning space in terms of my reality of what good taste is and you in these qualitative that, uh, assets, basically, you want to call it that, right? Music, visuals, pen, whatever, videos, things like that. Right? And then interface, and then what what I'm taking what Javier is saying is the real challenge is, well, also I just say because I'm a designer, right? So that's my main practice. So actually I, I the answer is yes, you actually have to deal with this potential conflict of clients, tastes, preferences, and, and more importantly, their meaning systems. 
Because for example, we have certain vibes we have to go for, for as a designer, but the meaning of those terms and those vibes can be radically different for a client than for designers. And actually most of the work up front for creative directors, art directors, the more senior members of designers is we have to bridge that gap of meaning, right? And in fact, most of the tensions come up when that's not resolved. And it generally leads to then power and authority being imposed and saying, this is the meaning we're going with. And that's the end of the conversation. So this is a very live topic and actually in design disciplines, it's an actually, it's a real live question of how you negotiate, negotiate that. Usually it's a mode of persuasion and rhetoric. That's usually the answer of, well, very frankly, you need to find people who agree with your values. So you have to have basically the same thing, or you have to persuade them through authority of some mode of some variation. Uh, I'm not, I personally find that satisfying, but I think it's, that's why I think it's a live question because we actually don't know. And then Stanley, it's basically dealing with this question of private meeting spaces for these vibes and aesthetics versus the communal public space. Cause that's also the problem. As designers, we have to deal with producing for the comp, for a public interfacing. We're not doing for any individual one person. We have to deal with clients, personas, audiences, whom we have to serve, which are abstractions of populations, which may or may not be the client. A lot of times they're not. So these are, I can tell you, these are just areas of negotiation, unexplored, unanswered. And I think actually it's a live question. So I just want to share that. I think it's a great, I think it's a great point. It's all for me. I am thinking in this whole conversation where it's sort of philosophical and abstract, I'm also thinking about um, the applicant, like practical applications for all of this. And I was talking to someone who um, is considering uh, designing a product um, for finding new music that is um outside of spotify outside of like any sort of uh, um al an algorithm al algorithmically constructed playlists um like are not beyond this but he wants to create a uh an internet atmosphere where people are um and he wants to make it a dao where people are uh suggesting music for each other and so they're also so like you have the option to well you can you can just opt in or out to a, an algorithm choosing music for you at verse and then like having it be like a social media network where people are just it's just a forum for people to like scout music like you can like based on your use and based on your time within the environment within this social media channel um that like based on and which i think maybe loosely speaks to what thomas was just saying about um uh like seniority levels like based on your time being inside that inside that space you then get the privileges of being like a music scout and having and like bringing in different elements um and different tastes together and i think that people are going to i think that now that we understand a little bit more about like instagram twitter youtube about these algorithms being very exploitative being very much um about people's about capturing people's attention and activating like an addiction <laughs> piece of your brain, I think that people are going to try to apply um, some element of like, you're in a space and you as a creator, you're not just creating content that is gonna be picked up by an algorithm, you're gonna be creating content that is like suggestive in and of itself. And I think that that is where like the practical application of this kind of discussion is is going is that like you're not going to be right now content creators are making things that um like there's all sorts of strategies that you pick up as a content creator like for how to how to beat the algorithm or how to like work with the flow of the algorithm like you need to include like pictures of your face every once in a while or whatever stupid shit like that that'll boost you that'll boost attention in the feed but um but people yeah, arena, yeah, is is like this, Emilio, for sure. It's like a it's a major blueprint for this. But um like people, the kinds of contents content that people are gonna be they're they're gonna be like suggesting it and people are gonna be taking like content curator or content curation is like a um is like a term that's sort of like bastardized and used a lot, but like the actual curatorial aspect is gonna be way more um embedded in our social media use, I think, because of as a way to fight an algorithm curating things for us. Just add to that, I have a friend that does research in hospitals where they're, um, and then I'll pass it to Alexander Ebert and then Mr. Luber, where they did, they do um, doctors doing diagnosis, then computers doing, you know, computers doing diagnosis and then both. And they actually find that both gives you the best result as opposed to one of those, those two. It kind of makes me think of that. So Mr. Ebert. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just be a little curmudgeon, just have some fun. 
Uh, I think there's areas uh, that benefit from optimization. Uh, doctors, like if I'm in a hospital, I want the most optimized experience, right? <laughs> I don't want like an incidentalist doctor who's like, oh, you know what? Let's, uh, let's just try hacking off your arm, see what happens. But for the most part, what I'm seeing in algorithm algorithms and even in non-algorithmic sort of capitalist society is optimization uh, in the social theater of status anxiety. So for instance, um, what, what I would like to see is getting rid of the element or, or mitigating the element of status anxiety to the extent that, for instance, I don't necessarily get hit up by Substack with details about how I can increase engagement because all of these algorithms, it just turns me into another algorithm that's trying to optimize engagement. And then what that prompts me to do is, okay, I guess I better keep my language dumber, keep the whole text shorter, keep it to like a two, three minute read. Fuck. Then that's doing that across the board. And how are we supposed to incentivize ourselves to think more deeply or be more nuanced or express ourselves at length in a way that um, might provide both ourselves and other people with more insight? Yeah, maybe a smaller pool of people. But what we might be able to do is function on more of a sort of grant type basis where we're not constantly thinking about the theater of status anxiety, but rather we are there to provide uh, non-optimized uh, work. For instance, um, I'm not worried about my status anxiety in comparison to some other writer, but I'm there for a very specific reason. And I'm there to provide a whole bunch of nuance and to write in such a way that the size of my audience doesn't matter. It's sort of the, you know, I'm filling a hole in the tapestry of society. But instead what happens, instead of each of us having sort of this idiosyncratic place in the tapestry, um, we're all trying to fill the exact same space. We're all, we're all competing. We're all writing the three minute piece. We're all doing the same fucking thing because we're all being fed the same information about how to optimize our engagement. And I just think it's, I just think it's a shitty, a, a shitty way to roll. It flattens all of the plural, the, the pluralistic ideas and ideals of society that we pretend to hold dear. And, um, and you end up with, uh, you know, music, movies, everything is a very good example of, uh, you can see it throughout culture, the sort of flattening of content where all you have is sort of superhero movies and sequels, or you got this and, you know, and then music it all sounds the same. And I think in, 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 in philosophy, we have an opportunity because we haven't been uh, commoditized yet, even though memes, anybody who posts a meme is a philosopher. Um, we have an opportunity to try and do it differently, but I would like to be like, I think I'm going to hold, be a holdout against optimization. I think optimization is actually the enemy. It's, it's anti-incidentalist. Uh, and if I'm constantly optimizing my time in that capitalist sense or optimizing my engagement, I'm going to be foregoing uh, the gemstones of my, uh, of my thinking. And I think, it's, I think it's really dangerous to be optimizing all the time optimizing in our relationships, uh, telling people what my needs are, setting my boundaries, making sure we're really flowing in this relationship. I don't, I don't, I think that negates a lot of magic. And um, I think that things are cool when they're messy. And um, I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to, I'm going to keep being like, hey, let's be a little, let's be a little messier, you know, because this is getting a little clinical. Anyway, all right, cheers. <laughs> No, that's magnificent. I'll pass it on to Ms. to Andrew. And I mean, too, what I was saying with it, it actually is the case when you just try to optimize algorithmically in a funny way, you actually are less optimization because you need the messiness. You need the creativity of the human doctor to be part of the process or actually it becomes flat and dead, but not in a good way. You know, there's a difference between the good death you discussed that kind of stops um, cancer, but then there's the depth that's actually more of what I call an effacement. So, oh, it's, it's exactly right. It's like you need, uh, you need distance and depth. If you have depth, but you don't have any distance, you don't go anywhere. But if you have distance and no depth, you're shallow. It's always that doubleness that's so, that's so tricky. So I think that's exactly the case. And, and Andrew? Uh, a lot to unpack from that. I really agreed with a lot of what you were saying. Um, the one thing, though, that I didn't agree with was the, the meme is a philosopher. And the reason why I, so it, with, with, with regard to what you were saying, and this basically go, ties back to visual literacy and basically us going back to that like primordial way of comprehending 
um, information. And um, basically, I think we've caught ourselves, I completely agree, we've caught ourselves in this like flattening uh, entertainment wise. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a writer, so I, I definitely see it in LA with fellow writers where they're just like writing for the sake of fulfilling some algorithm or some you know niche like and not coming from like uh the soul so to speak um to me it's we've caught ourselves in a place where our our theme our our i like to use the term placehood we put ourselves in a place where algorithm like the algorithm is a place where we've put our thereness our being in it's just it's just a, a decision that we made as a collective in a sense not all together but gradually in time that we've chosen to put ourselves in that place and i don't think it's like the ultimate place and i think it's just one like you're talking about like the canvas of life so to speak it's just one like regional one location one location that we've so, so happened to put ourselves in. And that I think why we put ourselves in is a discussion in itself. But what I've wanted to kind of like go toward is that uh, I have a friend uh, who's an a and who showed me this artist called La Russell. Um, and what's really unique about this artist is he would hold concerts. He was found because he would hold concerts in the back of his home. And he didn't use, he didn't put himself in this, like, I would call this algorithmic place. And that he purely gained meaning in his, in his artwork by just doing a concert and whoever would show up would show up. It's kind of like what Daniel's doing with the network here, like with the net. It's like, he's just going to do this and whoever comes, comes. Like, uh, he just wants to do it because there's that intrinsic motivation, like kind of to go back to um, what I was saying about action. But uh, it, 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 the, the, me, the meme is a philosopher, to, to talk about that for a second. The meme being a philosopher to me just means that they have really understood their placehood, their placehood in the algorithm. And in that sense, they're more like a scientist than a philosopher. Like to me, a philosopher is someone who identifies different regions of, of different places in a way where it's not like, like what, I'm sure a philosopher can diagnose and, 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 and give their thoughts on um, what's happening in, in today's world and why, you know, capitalism is X and Y or whatever just using capitalism as an example. But to me, I think if we were to treat philosophy as like a Hegel project, a Heidegger project, like these, these type of projects, like they, in a sense, found different like regions of, of, I don't like to use the term being, but like regions of being that they reveal themselves. It's like, it's like to bring back the surprise and what I was saying, what I'm saying with the inciting incident. So like they put their, they're in a place, so they're in this new place, their beingness, their thereness is in a new place. And because it's in a new place, it's unfolding to them in a way where it's like a phenomena, like, like in the Heidegger sense, where it's like revealing itself. And that in itself is to me the surprise. And it's being able to wander to a new place in terms of like that existential place, like, like to get to really clarify what I'm saying. So to speak Heidegger, Dawson just simply means being there. So being there, if you're there, your thereness is in a place. And depending on the relationship between your thereness and that placehood will determine how you process things essentially even how you process things internally within the thereness that you're contained in so to speak um so i just think that if we try almost like what you're saying like 
keep it messy. Like if something is presented, like a pathway is presented, this is how you become X or Y. I, I would almost like people to like consciously not do that path because almost every path that you are put on and set on will in today's world will pretty much lead you to this algorithmic place like my like my dad's a lawyer for example and even how they like market their like like their firm it, it, it doesn't seem like it was like 20 30 years ago it, it seems like they're focusing on instagram they're focusing on TikTok, they're focusing on these algorithmic places. So it's just, um, yeah, I think we just need to surprise ourselves by, by kind of taking the hard road and doing something that's not a path, a, a, a pathway that's commonly presented in today's world. On the question of can being be philosopher or scientist, you know, speaking from that, the, the, the Heideggerian, there's a sense, if I understand what you're saying correctly, is the notion that the meme is not located um, in any sort of there that anyone is actually in. It kind of occupies its own that has a disembodiment and it's not pointing to, to anything beyond uh, what people are already unfolding. And the philosopher has to direct toward a different unfolding. Therefore, the meme is questionable in its ability to be a tool of philosophy. Now, would you say that, um, if I understood that, understand correctly, and please correct me if I'm incorrect, um, mm -hmm. would you say that the meme could be used philosophically, uh, that it can have uh, that potential if used in the correct way, or is it inherently um, incapable of that function? I think that after the, it's going to sound funny, but I think after the first meme, it's inherently, like, once you come up with your own meme, like, and it's completely, I don't, crudely novel, a novel meme, then that's it. Then someone else has to find their own uh, path, if you will, or their own uh, meme, if you will. Like, I think, like, in today's world, when I, when I hear, like, when he was saying the meme is a philosopher, I'm thinking, like, I got a friend who, like, posts memes on, on Instagram. Like, I don't, I don't regard him as like the philosopher type because in my mind he's doing what plato hate like he's doing what plato talks about what like the artist does he's just like really watching the internet he's reflecting on like what's notable what's salient and then just kind of taking it copying it and putting it on his own account and i feel like that's what most mean people are doing where i think there's very few people who actually sit there, watch behavior, go out into the world, experience something, experience a commonality of, of, of some kind and it is able to create some kind of like uh, pinpoint where people can like witness that pinpoint and be in the same like common understanding place, basically. Where I think like those, are, those people are more few and far between. Most people are, are, are doing like the imitation and just doing like what will fit the algorithm. If I'm gonna, if you're thinking in terms of fitting into a place, you're already like kind of what I'm saying, act like from the beginning of the conversation, acting in like an, an authentic state. You're, you're, and where to me, like a philosopher is very authentic. It's like the story that is like within them, so to speak, unfolds without, like unfolds through and out of them in a way where it's like they don't have control. It's like Socrates, it's like Socrates didn't have a choice but to, but to question people in his mind. It's like he couldn't help but annoy people. It's not like he would like think about, damn, I'm really annoying people. Like maybe I shouldn't do that per se. Like it's, it was just like, that's what he does regardless of the, the consequences in a way. And it sounds like a little immoral when I say it like that. And I don't want it to be completely uh, an immoral thing. Um, but this does make me think of a, a random, not random, but uh, the concept of privacy. Uh, TikTok, 
they are able with the algorithm because we're in a certain place it's like being revealed that like tiktok can can mimic like what you're like not mimic but take in like know how you're typing patterns like that they have such access to such information that's um pretty crazy so it just makes me think is privacy a real thing or is it something made up and like because i think this us be dwelling in this algorithmic place is revealing that it seems like it's made up to me that pretty much everything is accessible and revealable and that there is no such thing as actual privacy no, I, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I need to stop locking my doors. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, but no, on the question <laughs> you're making, there is a, well, it's interesting to think, and then I'll pass, um, and we're drawing to a close here. So again, if anyone has anything they'd like to say, please go right ahead. Um, it makes me think of, is it the case that after the first book is made, after the first painting is made, after the first, et cetera, so forth is made, does it lose its ability to say, avoid capture? Is there something that is lost um, in the, uh, after the initial act of, say, a new media? Uh, that then takes away its ability uh, to, to work in a new direction. Because the thing that we've been talking about at the net, funny enough, because the name is the net, is say the ability to escape uh, the episode of Black Mirror where you end at a contest at the end and the revolution is absorbed into the mechanism of control where you're trying to escape Kafka's uh, The Little Circus and then you end up just being part of it and where mechanisms of trying to escape capture become mechanisms of part of the capture. And it does seem as if everything has a to everything, basically everything, has a tendency or possibility of being absorbed. It almost is like as soon as it's created, there's almost a clock ticking before it becomes integrated into systems of control. And that in order to stop that from occurring, there has to be a very active element of the individual, of the person, that, uh, that's making sure that this is not occurring. Uh, and that seems very difficult to do. Um, and it, arguably a part of the philosopher is to keep alive that activity to keep alive that making sure that one does not fall into those mechanisms of capture. Is it possible for say the mean to wake someone out of their dogmatic slumber? Is it possible for art? Because the problem you're describing sounds also a lot like can happen with art in general, right? Where art can be created and then it just turns into entertainment uh, where it loses its ability to guide, uh, to, to point to anything philosophically. And as a result, it just sort of feeds the machine. Um, it would seem interestingly, if we, pick up on the theme of uh, fluency that came up in the conversation there seems to be something there's almost a kind of fluent there's almost a kind of thoughtlessness where you're thoughtlessly letting the algorithm carry you along which is problematic but then there also seems to be a state where one learns how to fluently interact with the algorithm in a manner where they get the good from it to find the music they didn't know about it but also not to be captured by it where if you had to all the time think about how you were managing the algorithm or the technology or so on and so forth, then there would be a way in which you did not feel free. Uh, there would be a way in which you felt captured because you'd be existentially overwhelmed. So there seems to be a need to move, and maybe this is something the philosopher is in the business end, of moving individuals or helping people gain a certain fluency, a certain ontological fluency, if I just throw in a, a $10 word, uh, a certain fluency where one can interact with the arts, interact with the algorithms and the computers in a manner that, um, because it's hard to imagine, uh, you know, you were mentioning Heidegger, you know, Heidegger is not anti-technology. What he is concerned about is the tendency of technology to do our thinking for us without us realizing it. And there is something about technology that makes it very good at that. It is very, very difficult to avoid having technology do our thinking for us. Um, and we tend to think we're not letting our technology do our thinking for us when it simply outflanked us and figured out a way to do our thinking for us without it. So it's very complex. And figuring out these methods of fluency so that one can play the game without always being existentially overwhelmed seems to be part of what the philosopher is in the business. And, and this is where, as you know, I'm very interested in the language of action, Blondell, skill, handling expertise there's um this this uh this holding this witnessing seems to be important for the conversation of obtaining this fluency that seems very critical to avoid capture today uh, but if anyone else has anything else to say please go right ahead i would just add that you know to me the the reason why i say memes are ph philosophical is that to me philosophy is about actually taking disparate ideas and putting them in a singular place uh mm. so sun house iguana think about it right? a philosophical move right and that's what basically what memes do and they compress these sort of disparate ideas into a single place and the reason why i find them philosophical is because it actually requires the viewer 
to engage their nuance, to be able to unpack that hyper compressed object. Um, and I do think that memes probably hit a lot of people very, like not very differently, but differently. Uh, mm. One of the tropes of memes is actually to obscure or not describe what is compacted within the nuance so that you have sort of on an inner inside circle or inside track to even glean the meaning or the proper meaning from the, you know, you, you have to understand the 4chan legacy of the, you know, the, the one guy, whatever his name is, um, all the different sort of mimetic, uh, mimetic formats. So anyway, that's sort of what I meant by that, but um, just wanted to clarify. I I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree with that. It's it's the the problem I have is that I agree with that, but I also disagree with that in the sense that to me the way when you're talking about meme is just like unpacking like um, you know different dichotomies tied into one image with like a message or just packed them together. That to me is storytelling, like like philosophy, like storytelling if, if that's the criteria for philosophy and this is like what i've been going back and forth with my head for about two years now it's like if that's the criteria for philosophy which is what i was when i went to school that's what basically i understood with my major it was like these are all these ideas and they're very complex and like it's unpacking and unpack it's un it's unfolding in a way that i can understand and a meme is like a really good way to do that but at the same time, when I started writing stories, I, that's exactly what happened when I started writing screenplays and stuff. It's the same thing. It was literally the same thing. And so, like, you're a musician, I'm pretty sure. Like, when you, when you play a song, it's like, I don't know where it comes from for you, but like, I can say like crudely like, oh, I have all these emotions. I'm really good at singing and playing the guitar, let's say. I'm going to sing my heart out. I'm going to let this song like represent like how I feel. And that's a very complex like emotion, how I feel. So to me, I started asking myself, is philosophy that? Is philosophy that? Because to me, that's what the artist or the storyteller does. So that's when I started thinking like what makes like a, like a Heidegger project so unique was like, because I read a lot of Aristotle and Kant in college. And to me, like, with Kant had the same effect where it's like this new world, a numeral world, a priori. Like it, like, it was like a new location of life. It wasn't like unpacking necessarily. It was like, it was like just opening my eyes a little bit more in a way. And then with Heidegger, it was the same thing. It was like, He's like telling me things that I already know, like I already feel in a way, but he's doing it in a way that it's making me understand it completely differently, where it's like, I don't remember, like, I mean, you do get that in movies and in songs where it's like, oh my God, that really like, that John Mayer song really put that heartbreak in the, in the place for me. But in that sense, it's like doing the same thing just in different ways. Sorry. Yep. I think what you're describing is that there's the qualifier is revelation of some kind uh, on the part mm -hmm. of the recipient, you know? So like a story that isn't philosophical is one that just holds your hand the whole time. And, and then you go as opposed to making you do any work because work and difficulty, you had something has to be obscured in order for it to be discovered. And I think that that obscured, aspect is inherent to philosophy and poetry so that the larger the gaps between the imagery uh, the more disparate and then the more they come together the more work you have to do to insert yourself into the ingresses between those images and then you discover something right you discover something that was obscured to you previously or whatever so they're very you know there, there's a lot of storytelling that is philosophical then there's a lot of storytelling that's less philosophical but they're not orthogonal you know art forms um so, yeah, and it depends. Some memes are just really basic and it's a guy whistling at the girl going by and there's nothing to discover. There's nothing you had to figure out. But a lot of memes, there's actually a discovery process. We're like, what? And then you're like, oh, you know, so there's this sort of this rolling uh, dialectic between story. I think poetry is much more akin to philosophy where in poetry, 
the poet sort of intentionally leaves obscured gaps between images them so that you actually have to do a little bit of work in order to glean the meaning, you know? Yeah, the kind of, the build of what Alexander is saying, you know, Andrew, I, I think your proposition is very, your provocation is very interesting, right? This idea of the storytelling property and philosophy, is it there or not? I have to say, I mean, the use of, of Kant and Aristotle, or I can even add uh, Aquinas, these are system makers. So their purpose, that, that's a very, that's an important distinction, right? Because because you could argue um, that's a one mode of philosophy is a systems builder, where the purpose of it is to build from proposit from axioms an entire system to give account for everything, basically, within their purview of a of conversation, which was one of my most annoying by Kant is when he when he acknowledges that there's a limit to what he's saying, is oh no, no, we can't talk about that. That's the that's the nomina, that's the outside our conversation, which I find very annoying because that leads to a very annoying bracketing of metaphysics. Anyways, that's a separate discussion. But I would actually say, personally for me, I'm a huge Aristotle fan. So I actually find the joy in Aristotle comes from Plato's dialogues, which is narrative in nature. So I do think that's a different mode of philosophy. I think the best story, best capturing is from a kind of balancing, right? That comes from reading the Platonic dialogues, right? Which a lot of them purposely are not systems building and they are not conclusion building. They actually lead to an aporia, kind of like, I don't know what the hell this is. What's the answer? I don't know. It's fun to have Aristotle you can come in and come memory to Aristotle's account to build on. And can you get a context about what Aristotle is doing? Because you just read Aristotle systematically. The cat if you just read the categories, just dumped in, they're the most boring textbook stuff in the world. It's ridiculous to ask someone to read that. But if you read the Platonic dialogues related to the topics that the Cariharis talks about, of what is being, what is the contradictions of negation, for example. How can you say that non-being doesn't exist? You know, university of things of being versus equivocation of being. Those things make more sense when you read Platonic dialogues and then come to Aristotle to see what he's getting at. You don't have to agree with Aristotle. You can find, you actually more importantly can find the flaw in the thinking by seeing Platonic thought, by mode of dialogue. The other thing, by the way, is, you know, one way of the argument that Narrative structures are, I mean, basically, let me put it this way. What is a syllogism? It's an if-then conditional. Is it not? It's a mode, it's a transition of, of thought through a category and giving it loss. I mean, as narrative storytelling is hypothetical reasoning. It's just saying, if this is true, or suppose this is true, that good narrative is barely based on one of its credentials is it has to be taken seriously in terms of this is a reasonable proposition. This is a reasonable inferencing. And then working through narratively, what is the consequences of that? And good storytelling does that. You have characters who have a certain kind of structure of logic built within them that when you put in situations, they will naturally go through a certain consequence. And the good narrative storytelling is telling that. And actually good storytelling is they don't, the author didn't even know what's going to happen. They kind of have an inner logic that the, uh, the writer kind of lets happen. It, it, a bad story is when it's very rigid. And it's like pre-stripted of what's going to happen. And the, you can feel the hand of the author forcing the plot all the way through versus letting it play out naturally. But this is a really, th I, I just want to point out, this is a very nat very natural, I think, uh, very rich provocation. Where do I stand on this? I think, as I just said, I think, I think just systems building alone doesn't get the job done. Um, we need a kind of a richer narrative, narrative telling. Uh, just one last note, uh, this ad the question of means being in or not. I think a lot of means is affective, affective off. Let me say it's literally the cognitive offloading of affect, which is disastrous. It basically means that we don't have our own emotions. We just relegate emotions to be done by other simulations. And then our job is then, I, we got to some previous weeks in this group, is then what do we do with friends now? We just share memes. We don't even communicate our, our affects anymore. We just communicate the meme to represent our affect. And then that's the agreement or an enjoyment or sure taking in the affect that's reproduced by something else. But anyway, that's, a, that's just a adding on that point. So, like, I completely agree with what you're saying with the conditional, with the conditional aspect to um, storytelling, the if-then, basically. And storytelling is a great way of receiving knowledge and that just how that un unfolds and whatnot. I, I find it so true that there's a certain logic within certain protagonists to good stories that it's like, those are the when you think of a certain mode of being you can relate it to that particular protagonist 
Now, take what I just said, and you could apply the same thing to all those great philosophers. That's what's so puzzling to me, where it's like, there's the Kantian logic. Like, when uh, I watch, like, what's like an iconic, iconic Forrest Gump, when there's a certain way of living life where it's just, just do, you don't need to be smart, just do. I'm, I'm sure there's way more to Forrest Gump than just that. But there's a certain way that life is captured by Forrest Gump that I find very similar to how, for example, Kant captures life. Not saying that they capture life in the same way, but the act of their capturing is of, is, is of, of the same essence. So it makes me question if there's an actual distinction between philosophy and storytelling besides how the content, how the sentimental content is revealed to them. Like Kant will write a long book, really dense, and you have to really reread each sentence because you're not quite sure what the fuck he's talking about. Forrest Gump, that's a movie you could probably just watch one time and digest it. Like there are different ways of expressing like a certain cap a sentimental capturing but they're both doing the same act just in a different way and i find that very interesting and it makes me question the nature of philosophy in terms of it's it's telos it's it's goal it's main purpose and and storytelling because it seems like if they they, they have the same purpose and depending on the storytelling storytelling can be very complex you know, like I watched Memento with my mom. She's like, what the fuck was that? But like, if you rewatch it, you will really get it. Same thing with Inception, not to use the same director, but it's like, you might not understand it, but there's a definitive theme. Like him not knowing that he's in reality or not, that cliffhanger was very purposeful because it's like love, love exists regardless if it's in dream or in reality. But for you to get there, you got to be a well-versed movie watcher or you got to watch the movie a lot. So it's the same thing with like a philosopher. If, you, if you're a well-versed philosopher, you might not need to read the text as slowly as me or reread it as much as me who's like not a world whatever philosopher. But that's all. Go ahead. Yeah. This, you know, I hate to be drawing to the close because the question of the relationship. Sorry, between, sorry. No, no, Andrew. I mean, everything that everyone is getting at on the relationship between philosophy and art is a question that I am obsessed with. Um, it is precisely so difficult because they are so similar, and yet there are distinctions. Uh, but what are those distinctions? There seems to be figuring out how to make art and philosophy overlay but not blur. That seems to be very important and it seems very difficult to do, but it also seems important because it seems to me to have something to do with um, escaping capture, not ending up at the end of Black Mirror, not ending up in a Kafka story. There is something here. Um, also, Trey, Trey from Tell Us Bound walked in. Trey is fantastic. Everyone go to his channel. He does fantastic work on many, many outstanding thinkers. So Trey, great to see you, sir. Alas, we are reaching the end, my dear friend, uh, but we are talking a lot. We've gone from algorithms. Uh, we were talking about capture architecture, um, Zoom as a form of, uh, well, not Zoom, uh, the, uh, the uh, see, I don't even use it, TikTok as a form of gathering news. And now we're talking about one of my favorite subjects on the relation of art and uh, philosophy. Um, and I was going to note, um, and, and is that it's very interesting with Plato when he talks about banishing the poet. So he does a few things. He says the problem with poets is they make shadows of shadows, right? Uh, and he also suggests that shadows are what keep people in the cave. But he makes a really interesting distinction. Um, he says, well, we can teach Homer. And in fact, we got to teach Homer. It's like, what? Uh, why can Homer stay? And what's kind of suggested, it's also very important to realize that Plato wanted to be a playwright. That was something he really wanted to do. He was a very talented artist. There is a suggestion in Plato's banishment of the artist that actually um, the education, there is a kind of philosophical art that is essential to the education of the philosopher king. But in fact, it is so difficult to sort of find that, that art, that poetry, and it's not by chance I think uh, Homer is poet, poetic, uh, because I do think poetry, say, in a Wallace Stevens and Asbury and Eliot and so on, seems to bring out, um, is very philosophical in nature. It tends to be, like Mr. Ebert was saying, because you have to connect the, figure it out. Um, 
Plato is almost suggesting that it is so difficult not to have art come in that blurs art and philosophy, that most of it has to keep out. But something like Homer, who according to Plato somehow manages to keep them overlaying but not blurred, is essential and that we have to have it. Well, my goodness, how do we determine that? Maybe that's just Plato's, you know, Socrates, Plato's bias uh, to determine that. But there is something about art that seems essential, but there's also something dangerous about it. As there's something about logos, you know, if we use Mr. Bard's terms of logos, mythos, and pathos, all three of those seems essential, but every single one of them seems dangerous precisely because they have a tendency to present the world as if they are all that is needed. Um, and so how does one overlay them without blurring? That seems very difficult. To Andrew's point, a good character is funny because a story, you have to set out the settings, you have to set out the characters and make sure that it all maintains internal consistency with itself. Um, in the same way that a philosopher has to set up their axioms and make sure everything maintains internal consistency to itself. And yet the telos, and you know, Trey was saying with telos bound, um, are different. What is different? How are they different? What are they doing differently? Why? What are the distinctions? Why is maintaining those distinctions important? That all seems very important to me. And on that extremely big uh, question, I fear uh, we will have to resume that uh, next week if people can make it. Um, and thank you all so much for coming today. I really enjoyed this. And I'm, I'm glad we're getting on this topic of story versus philosophy, the similarities, the differences, what those are exactly. Because I actually think this question is part of the the this 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 um theme dare I say of these net conversations of this of this difficulty of avoiding capture this difficulty of not ending up part of the system that you think you're escaping to me exploring this question is very important to that uh, but on that very hysteric point that I am making and not elaborating on I appreciate you all for your time thank you very much everyone